Chris, when you first heard the suggestion about televising a Knox football game, was it even in the realm of possibility for you? Didn't seem so. It's, uh, it really is terrific that we're able to do this, but uh, never had any idea that it would be able to be done. How do you think it came about then? Well, it's uh, exciting that um, the the Siwash Athletic Club uh, has uh, taken us on as, its pro as a project, one of its major projects, and we're very pleased at the college that they've been able to not only raise the, the money required to do the production, but also uh, they put in an extraordinary amount of time and effort in s locating the sites and, and all of the people out there who have um, uh, put have, have worked on uh, developing sites for the, the showing. So every one of you out there who is uh, involved with that, uh, you know, you, you have my thanks. But the Siwash Athletic Club has been very supportive of Knox Athletics so far uh, in, the in the year and a half or so since it, they began. You know, one of the things that we wanted to make sure you had a chance to talk about, though, were some of the other activities at Knox. But, you know, the football game is a good opportunity to present that information. But what are some of the other exciting things going on at school now? Well, we're excited. We're, this is the largest opening enrollment we've had since 1973. We have um, 1,150 uh, students uh, this fall. Uh, it's, uh, and it, 390 of those students are, are, are freshmen. So. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, students are participating in more activities than uh, they have in a lot of years. Uh, we opened uh, up football camp this fo this summer with uh, 92 people and, and 87 lockers. So uh, uh, Coach Gibbons asked what we should do, and I said, "Well, you know, after a few two a days, uh, we'll be okay." But uh, and it worked out. But. Um, one, we're, we're very uh, pleased with the size of the student body and the quality, excellent quality in the student body. Uh, the faculty has uh, continued to grow in size. We're up to 95 faculty positions from 79 four years ago. What role have you seen the alumni play in the growth and development of Knox over the years that you've been here? Well, the, for first of all, it's the, the, the the volunteerism uh, on the part of uh, alumni have, has been uh, very exciting. Those people who've gotten involved in uh, admissions work and, and encouraging students to come to Knox, take a look and take a vi and visit. Uh, once they see the campus and the and the beautiful uh, uh, view vista as you look out uh, past uh, Old Main. Yeah, you can sell them. It really sells the students, and, and we're excited about an alumni involvement in admissions. And of course, the annual fund has been uh, very important. Uh, that has grown now by uh, over two and a half uh, times in four years. So uh, we have a goal, an ambitious goal this year of uh, nearly three million dollars, which would be a tripling of the annual fund in five years. And we're beginning a capital campaign, and alumni have. Uh, um, been very supportive of that. Well, I'd just like to again uh, thank the Siwash Athletic Club for its uh, very dedicated work to advancing athletics at Knox and to everyone who's uh, uh, participating in today's game uh, through this telecast and, and, and enjoying it and uh, uh, just uh, hope our, our record against Monmouth continues to uh, be a positive one. We're uh, look, looking for victory all the way. So, uh, and and also have a open uh, offer an open invitation to people to come back to campus at any time. Steps up in the pocket. He's got the uh, Kurtzman coming across. 35, across the 35 to the 37 first down. There's nothing quite like college football. As sportscaster Chris Schenkel used to say, what a lovely way to spend an autumn afternoon. And of course, big time football is extra special. Just mention the big time and you think of Southern Cal, Notre Dame, Michigan, and Penn State. 
But stick around for the next few minutes. We're going to show you what the big time is really all about. You see, there's more to being in the big time than just playing football. Knox College sits in the heart of the Midwest, in Galesburg, Illinois. The 40,000 Galesburg residents embrace Knox as the cultural and intellectual center of the community. And it's pretty much been that way for the last 150 years. You see, Knox goes all the way back to 1837. And it has a heritage of nurturing some of the brightest and most successful people in the history of our country. You can find the Knox influence in many top organizations, institutions, and companies. Students who were there, uh, even though they were playing football, were not dumb jocks by any stretch of the imagination. These were intelligent people who um, uh, were um, destined to have very productive uh, careers in whatever they decided uh, that they wanted to uh, uh, pursue. And, uh, um, and I mean, you could tell that in the huddle. I mean, you know, you call the plays, and, uh, and uh, everybody understood what you were talking about. Knox began its football program before the turn of the century. Knox helped found the Midwest Conference in 1921. The other early members included Beloit, Carleton, Cornell, Lawrence, and Co. If you haven't heard of those schools for their athletic prowess, you've certainly heard of them for their academic record. The Midwest Conference contains some of the finest liberal arts colleges in the country, like-minded institutions who see athletics as an integral part of the college experience not just an economic enterprise whose purpose is to fill stadiums and fulfill TV contracts. Today, 11 schools in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa make up the conference. The Knox tradition of academic excellence is also the bedrock of the athletic program. You hear a lot these days about rules that would require colleges to report their athletes' graduation rates. Knox doesn't measure success by graduation rates every football player graduates. It doesn't measure success in NFL first round draft choices. It never had one and never will. It doesn't measure success by counting the number of men on scholarship. Knox doesn't offer scholarships, at least not the football kind. Knox doesn't even have a collection of 300 pound gorillas who just want to play ball. No, if you're going to call Knox the big time, you've got to look down the field, so to speak, to look at what happens after those four years in college. Trial is no different than mentally preparing yourself for a football game. When you've been on the football field against a guy that was 30 or 40 pounds bigger than you are, it, what's, what's the guy <laughs> across the courtroom who's usually smaller than I am anyway? The best way to understand what the big time really means is to look at some of the men who played on Siwash teams in the late 80s and early 90s. That's recent enough to help you identify with the program, but it's far enough back to show how these players have made their mark in the life after football world. When they wore the purple and gold, we referred to them as tackles, linebackers, and running backs. Today, we refer to them as doctors, lawyers, and CPAs. Check out the 1987 roster. Three MDs, three lawyers, five MBAs, one PhD, three masters, and seven business executives. They did their graduate studies at such notable universities as Duke, Illinois, Michigan State, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Washington of St. Louis. Now that's a lineup. But wait a minute, these guys did not spend all of their time in the library. They could play. Just take a look around campus, class in every way. The brand new field house gives Knox athletes and the rest of the student body an indoor workout facility that would be the envy of many large universities. While Memorial Gym has been the home of Knox basketball teams for almost 40 years, it is just as up to date as the day it opened. But the Knox facilities don't begin and end with the athletic department. Campus landmarks include Old Main, the site of one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the Eleanor Abbott Ford Fine Arts Center, and the recently renovated Seymour Library, boasting several impressive nationally known collections. And, and Knox has demonstrated a commitment to strength in both its athletic and academic programs. As Knox President John McCall put it, Knox College recognizes that excellence in athletics and excellence in academics complement each other. The crucial qualities of integrity, discipline, ambition, the courage to conquer adversity, 
to make mistakes, to take risks, are all qualities defining excellence in class and on the field. But that old idea of a true student athlete hasn't changed since the 19th century, and it won't. You see, that's all part of playing in the big time. Come find out for yourself. Mm. It says here, the soybeans your dad and I grow are a rich source of natural vitamin E, which has 36% greater potency than synthetic vitamin E. Yeah, Grandpa, that's part of my school project, all about soybeans and vitamin E. Look, first you and Dad plant the soybeans in the spring. Then in the fall, you harvest them, and the trucks haul them to the processing plant. That's where the Archer Daniels Midland Company makes all sorts of things with soybeans, like vegetable oil, margarine, flour. And about a hundred other things. Oh, yeah, like vitamin E. Mm -hmm. Enough to supply nearly 450 million people with their recommended daily allowance. Our teacher says it's more than the whole population of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So what else can you tell me about soybeans and vitamin E? As an extension of the farm, the Archer Daniels Midland Company continues making the most out of what farmers grow. Back in the Knox Bowl in Galesburg, Illinois, we are at halftime of the 108th playing of the Bronze Turkey game. The Prairie Fire leading the Fighting Scots 14 to 7, and Caden Brader is down on the sidelines with Knox Athletic Director Harley Nosher. Brad, this man needs no introduction. Harley Nosher, head of the athletics department here at Knox for, seems like forever. <laughs> Not quite forever, Caden. Not quite forever. Now I'm going to take you back a little. 1960, the year you arrived at Knox College from the Big Ten. Uh, your original impressions of the program here, what you heard at a team meeting for the football team that year. Oh my gracious, that, that's, uh, that does go all the way back, Caden. But I can remember uh, the, the indication was we were going to try hard to win one ball game. And that was kind of tough for me to imagine uh, coming from situations where we like to think we could be pretty successful. So yes, I remember that very well. And thank goodness we've done a little bit better than that over the years. From that time period to today, did you ever think that you would come full circle and find yourself in a, a game broadcast on national television? No, really didn't. And of course, without the uh, really uh, incredible efforts of the Siwash Athletic Club, it never would have happened uh, as far as the TV part is concerned. And uh, we're very appreciative of that. What do you feel games like today's uh, have to be learned for other people around watching Division Three football, watching Knox football in the athletic program? What's to be learned from these types of games? The lesson of this kind of a game? The lesson is that the game should be played for the sake of the game and the kids who play it. Uh, the fact that uh, today hundreds, maybe a, a thousand, fifteen hundred people are enjoying it is great, but the real reason to play and the justification for Division Three athletics the is, is the fact that uh, about uh, 70 mm -hmm. and, and 50, 120 great kids are having a heck of a time and a very positive experience. And your feelings for the game so far today, I know you wanted to see him put it away in the first quarter. So far today, I would like to think that we've uh, given up two or three times the score that would have uh, put us in a position where my stomach would feel better and our coaches would and our kids would. Uh, but I'm happy that we're ahead and uh, happy with a half to go. I think we'll know what to do to stay on top. Well, you've seen the program through the development of the field house and state-of-the-art facilities, really, uh, for the benefit of the alums. Where do you see this program going? Caitlin, uh, where I see it going is, is pretty much where it is now, in, into a position at the college uh, where it's appreciated for its educational value, where young people, men and women, have an opportunity to put athletics with their academic experience uh, for a total rounded uh, four years. And uh, I, I hope that it continues in that direction. I know that it will. And uh, I look for it in, in the next century to be something that all Knox alumni can be proud of just the way they are now. And right now, where do you see this game going? I see this game going uh, into the win column for Knox College to tie up this all-time series at 49, 49, and 10, and uh, to give our seniors, who are a tremendous bunch of young people, an opportunity to finish their career on a winning note. And I might add to make it the fourth consecutive winning season for Knox football. Which wouldn't be bad, kiddo. That wouldn't be bad. Congratulations, Harley. Thanks, Kate, and thanks for being here. And, and above all, thanks to all the people across the country that are making it possible for this to go out to so many Knox alumni that uh, we really appreciate. Well, the alumni, along with Harley Nosher, made it possible. Back to you, Brad. Thank you, Caden. And, of course, the alumni watching from Akron to Washington today. All kinds of sites around the country, from coast to coast. We're, from, we're in Boston today. We're in Kansas City, Missouri. We're out west in Seattle and San Francisco. And, again, we thank all of you for being with us here today. We're at halftime, 14-7, to 7, Knox leading Monmouth.
You are watching a special broadcast of Knox College football made possible by the efforts of the Siwash Athletic Club. This plant is a rich source of natural vitamin E. This plant uses that source to make enough vitamin E to meet the daily requirement of nearly 450 million people. This is a soybean plant. And this is an Archer Daniels Midland vitamin E plant, where soybeans are used to produce natural vitamin E, officially recognized to have 36% greater potency than synthetic vitamin E. Two very different plants, one very essential vitamin. Another reason why ADM is supermarket to the world. filled with twists and turns. Handle it. Dunlop Tires. In an era when doctors don't make house calls, and shopping is done in impersonal strip malls, why does John Deere have dealers that still deliver, that help you with parts and service, and answer questions on lawn care? Are we behind the time, or just prouder of the products we stand behind? To find out, why not ask your John Deere dealer? He's right where you need him. Back in Galesburg, Illinois, I'm Brad Benowitz along with John Allison. Happy to be with you here on this special broadcast of Knox College Football. We are at halftime of the 108th playing of the bronze turkey game. The Prairie Fire leading the Monmouth Fighting Scots 14 to 7 at halftime. And to be the, uh, as we replay some of the highlights here, there's the first scoring by uh, rather the second touchdown by the Prairie Fire as Matt Hayden ran it in for five yards. He did most of the work on that drive, led along a, led uh, by a long drive that Hayden made uh, that took that took Knox inside the Monmouth 20-yard line. Let's go down to the sidelines now at the center field. Ryan Steffelbeam getting a special presentation from Burger King on behalf of Knox College. Well, Coach Harley Nosher has seen the development of several all-time good football players, among them Ryan Stettelbeam, who is right now receiving an award, actually an award to Knox College, on his behalf from Nancy Carlson, a representative of Burger King, $10,000 to Knox College, and Ryan, one of 20 players selected by Burger King as a National Scholar Athlete. <laughs> And once again at halftime, Ryan Stuffelbeam getting the uh, the donation on behalf of Burger King to Knox College in the amount of ten thousand dollars. And our thanks to Kate and Bradar for being down on the sideline, bringing that to us. Once again, we are at halftime at the Knox Bowl. We hope you're warm wherever you are. It's a cold day here with wind chill about 30 degrees, 14 to 7 is the halftime lead the Knox Prairie Fire over the Monmouth Fighting Scots. We told you about the Matt Hayden touchdown, the five-yard run that gave Knox the two-touchdown lead, but Monmouth came right back and engineered a rather lengthy drive behind backup quarterback Josh Boyer, and here's how they were able to cut the lead in half as uh, Boyer got lots of time. He had good protection on the drive, John, and uh, just wide open as he found Andrew Tyra in the end zone, and it's amazing how... Uh, when you, when you give your quarterback time to find those guys, you give them enough time down there to run around, and uh, they'll get open eventually. Yeah, receivers will get themselves open if you give your quarterback enough protection. And that, th there might have been a breakdown on that play because he was pretty well wide open. And uh, that was a great drive, and that really put them back in the ball game. And they had a little momentum going there for a while, and then they had the ball back uh, toward the end of the half and uh, made, again, a couple of mistakes that, that took them out of that drive. But uh, Monmouth gets the ball coming out, and Knox needs to play some defense coming out of the halftime. Taking a look at some of the halftime stats as the Prairie Fire lead at 14-7. to seven. First downs on behalf of uh, the uh, Fighting Scots. Actually, more first downs than Knox in the first half, 7-6. to six. But look at the rushing yardage. Knox really dominated the game on the ground, almost a 2-1 to one advantage, 125-67. to 67. And total yards there uh, with, with, the, uh, with the advantage, too. And uh, maybe one of the key turn one of the key stats there, John, is the three turnovers. Knox was able to convert it into only one touchdown, but uh, the fact that they were able to keep that Monmouth defense on the field for so long in that first quarter 
and then uh, then to come right back and the, the one turnover that Knox made uh, of course allowed Monmouth to keep the ball uh, significantly in the second quarter and uh, as you said earlier really a game of two quarters right now. Right and uh, of course Knox did have another turnover too though I think they've forgotten about that interception in the end zone on the fade pattern. Uh, that was on the, the, the ball on the 10-yard line right there. So I think, you know, Knox needs to look at this. The first half is, you know, like you say, a battle of the two quarters, but really had an opportunity early to put a couple more on the board. And uh, like I said, they've got to come out and play some defense and try to get the ball back. Well, Monmouth had the ball last going into halftime, but wasn't able to punch it into the end zone. As really, they just kind of ran out of time. But they will get the ball starting off here in the third quarter as well. And maybe even more importantly, they'll have the win with them in the fourth quarter. So, John, do you really see any momentum loss going into the locker room, even though they didn't get it into the end zone? No, you know, I, I, I really don't. I think, uh, you know, both coaches had to go in and have some positive things to say to their clubs as they went in. Uh, so I think coming out, uh, you know, Monmouth is obviously going to be uh, positive from the standpoint they were able to move the ball there in the second quarter, and Knox has got to be uh, confident in the fact that that last drive uh, they were able to keep him out of the end zone and, and really not give him even a first down. And Monmouth turning the ball over three times in the first half and only down by a touchdown. The return taken at the 15-yard line, and look at the running room for John Vikey as he takes it up close to the 40-yard line, a 25-yard return to start off the second half. And look at the momentum start off uh, right here in the third quarter after a good return to take, uh, let's see where they spot the ball, actually back at the, uh, just across the Fighting Scots 37-yard line. So decent field position as we start off the second half. Blake Eli making the tackle to uh, bring that drive to an end. Just 10 seconds gone in the third quarter. Monmouth trying to tie this game up. Knox with a 14-7 lead after scoring the first two touchdowns. Monmouth scored last on that touchdown pass we showed you from Josh Boyer, who's still in the game, the second quarterback on the option keeper now. Running room goes. across the right side, up to the 50-yard line, first down territory, into Knox territory at about the 48-yard line. So Boyer showing some running ability as uh, he got a big opening across the right side before Josh Fordyce finally came in to make the tackle. Yeah, they, they completely fooled him. They didn't realize that uh, Josh still had the ball. Again, that's the option. You know, it caused you problems because you've got to play assignment football. Whoever has the quarterback has got to get the quarterback. You can't assume that somebody else has the ball. You've got to tackle your responsibility. And as we said in the first, uh, in the pregame show, actually, that the option game has caused the Knox defense some problems this year, starting back with the Lawrence game in the fourth game of the season, which the Prairie Fire lost. Here's the option again, a pitch into the backfield to turn with. Not a lot of running room, but he avoids a couple tackles and turns it into a gain of one on first down. So he just continued to run and continued to run before Matt Hannum fin uh, came over to finish him off. That play might have gotten a little more yards. The pitch was a little bit behind him. He had to turn back behind him and, uh, and, and catch the ball. But, uh, yeah, still made something positive out of it. You know, John, with you, we talked in the pregame show about what a family game it is uh, for you with your whole family coming to Notch and, uh, and your brother Bill being an assistant coach on the sidelines, your nephew Reed. How about Kelly Kane? His son, Sean, is in his first year as an assistant coach on the Monmouth sidelines. That's line, right, and, and of course, I, I worked for Kelly for a number of years and uh, coached his son, Sean, and, and I'm coaching his son, Casey, right now. So, yeah, it is. It's, a, it's kind of a, a fun experience for me because I've got feelings for both sides. Nathan Johnson takes the handoff for a gain of a couple as he takes it across the Knox 45-yard line before C.J. Tracy comes over to make the tackle. A gain of a couple. It's third and seven now for the Fighting Scots as we have played a minute and a half here in the second half at a 14-7 Knox lead. <coughs> A lot of the uh, last quarter and now into this quarter really it seems to have been played on the Knox side of the field. That's right. Two men in the slot, one wide out to the near side is the receiver Tyra and all kinds of pressure on the quarterback Boyer as three purple jerseys come crashing across. I think he might have hurt his leg too. And the officials, yeah, he, he came down real strange. Yep, he's hurt. Kind of got bent up underneath him. Brian, Ryan Kennedy, okay. one of the men to make the initial hit. Josh Fordyce also there. It's well, there's a, initial pressure right from the start of this play. Yeah, and there, watch there's the hit from Kennedy. And just back he goes, it. and he just sort of just sort of leg gets tucked down. up underneath him, and oh boy. Yeah. That, and it really could be either leg by the looks of that. I think it, it might be the leg that's tucked underneath him, to be, to be yeah. quite honest. And, I, you know, you hate to say, but it looks like it, it, you wouldn't be surprised if it was a broken leg on that play. It comes at the 12.55 mark of the third quarter and knocks with a 14-7 lead. 
and the game situation is now a punting situation for the Fighting Scots back in Monmouth territory at the 47-yard line. We'll take a timeout here. You are watching a special broadcast of Knox College football made possible by the efforts of the Siwash Athletic Club. Mm. Says here the soybeans your dad and I grow are a rich source of natural vitamin E, which has 36% greater potency than synthetic vitamin E. Yeah, Grandpa, that's part of my school project. All about soybeans and vitamin E. Look. First you and Dad plant the soybeans in the spring. Then in the fall you harvest them, and the trucks haul them to the processing plant. That's where the Archer Daniels Midland Company makes all sorts of things with soybeans, like vegetable oil, margarine, flour. And about a hundred other things. Oh yeah, like vitamin E. Mm -hmm. Enough to supply nearly 450 million people with their recommended daily allowance. Our teacher says it's more than the whole population of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So what else can you tell me about soybeans and vitamin E? Well, As an extension of the farm, the Archer Daniels Midland Company continues making the most out of what farmers grow. Yeah, that's right. the Knox Bowl in Galesburg, Illinois. 12.55 to play in the third quarter with Knox with a 14-7 lead. And, and this is unfortunate. We, we knew Josh Boyer went down hard on that play, and we're going to take another look at it. And uh, it, it looks like you pointed out, John, that, that leg that went behind him once, once the Prairie Fire comes through with the initial hit. Uh, he's backpedaling there, and he, there goes a plant leg, and now the other one kind of goes down, and he watched. That, it's that knee, that leg right there. Wow. And maybe a good thing that the official was standing there blocking Ooh. it, because we may not have wanted to see the rest of it. No, that was, uh, that was ugly. That was ugly. And uh, you could tell initially, immediately, you know, he was... Well, you never like to see that happen. No, absolutely I mean, Whether not. you're for the team or for the other team, it, you, you never want to see something happen like this. And a uh, little consolation at this point, but being a sophomore, he will play again. Yeah, it's it's too bad. Uh, he's a competitive kid and uh, loves to play football. You know, I, it, it's just too bad. And Monmouth trying to come back from down a touchdown, 14 to seven, was just under 13, 13 minutes to play in the third quarter. Psychologically, you have to wonder what what effect it ha might have right. on the Scots as they try to uh, try to rally here. Although it is a it is a punting situation when the game resumes. Yeah, they've got a. <clears throat> get their other quarterback to the side and, and Coach Kane's going to have to talk to him and uh, obviously their defense is going to have to come out and play right now but uh, that's a tough that's a tough loss because he was playing well. Boyer had really rallied this team well after Engeldow uh, was taken out of the game by Coach Kelly Kane and uh, Engeldow had, had really struggled in the early going and and Coach Kane w was not hesitant really at all to bring Boyer into the game, and he really got some things going for the Fighting Scots. But uh, again, uh, as what happened with Engeldow earlier on with the offensive line, not much pressure, and that's what's led to our injury timeout here. We'll take another break with a 14-7 lead for the Prairie Fire, 12.55 to play third quarter. You are watching a special broadcast of Knox College Football made possible by the efforts of the Siwash Athletic Club. <laughs> Sometimes life is an uphill battle. Handle it. Dunlop Tires. When asked, nine out of ten people say they'd rather be on vacation than at home. Of course, most of the people they ask wouldn't own a John Deere, because in survey after survey, folks are more satisfied with John Deere than other lawn tractors. Honey, it's green. It sure is. Oops. Nothing 
runs like a deer. Back in the Knox Bowl in Galesburg, 12.55 to play third quarter. 14 to 7 is the Knox lead, and the uh, the uh, trainers and paramedics still down on the field working on Josh Boyer. They have him uh, covered up now, trying to keep him warm on the stretcher as they look to be taking him off the field any moment now. And uh, the word from the sidelines we get is a possible hip dislocation. That's got to hurt. And, oh, especially on a day like this. And, and now when you look at the game aspect of it, as, as now they're... Now they're getting Monmouth backup quarterback Josh Boyer off the field, and re really the crowd now just beginning to applause. Everybody really kind of in a sort of a, a stunned silence as, as they watch them work on work on the sophomore quarterback down there. They'll get him off the field, and a lot of the players out there on a cold day like this, John, with a wind chill of 30 degrees, uh, we, we saw them during the interim there hopping up and down and trying to stay warm, and you really hope that, uh, that just standing around like they did doesn't lead to like a hamstring pull or something like That's that because right. it's easy to happen on a day like this. Yeah, you got to keep moving around. So Monmouth in a punting situation on 4th and 16 from the Fighting Scots 47-yard line. Back to booted away John Bikey, the freshman, with 12.55 to play third quarter. And two men back to receive for the Prairie Fire, Ben Van Blera, number 25, and Ooh, Drew Sherman. Almost, and almost blocked as the punt sails out of bounds inside the, well, the inside the 30-yard line. Tony Spaziri was the guy who came bursting through and almost got a hand on it. Well, that was close. And the officials are going to spot it to the nose of the football on the Prairie Fire 30-yard line. So decent field position for Knox as they try to build on this touchdown lead. Dave Alex. Shane Wetter was warming up on the sideline, so we'll see if he's been affected at all. You heard uh, Caden Brader say that uh, he was nursing something there going into halftime. This is his first snap of the second half. Fakes the handoff to Hayden, now rolling right on a bootleg. Looking downfield, nobody open, and he just keeps it and steps out of bounds for a gain of a yard. Terrific coverage downfield. Had Wozniak, Plask is on the near side, and Ladeau on the far side, and nobody was open. Well, Knox, Knox has got to look to gain that momentum back a little bit here. Uh, they've got a, the wind at their back, and uh, you know, a good defensive play or a good defensive series. They've got to come out now and try to get some positive things going on offense. Both teams playing for a great deal of pride. Knox playing for a winning season for the third straight year and trying to gain the bronze turkey for the third straight year. I formation. Here's the handoff to Hayden. Bounces off a tackle at the line of scrimmage. Running room across the left side. Up to the 50-yard line and then tackled there. And down he goes. And Hayden, after initially bouncing off the line of scrimmage, it was Jim Hardesty who finally came over and made the tackle at the Monmouth 49-yard line. Hayden just like a rubber ball off the off the uh, defensive line, and out he came to the near side. Here's another look at it. He's so good at just stepping up. He reads this. Nothing's there. Just take it outside. Oh boy, that's that's great. That's just instinctive stuff. He, I shouldn't say that. My brother coaches the running backs. He's probably taught him all of that. So. I, you know. <laughs> well, at least you can you can take pride <laughs> in that. Now the handoff to Hayden on a draw. Terrific coverage there. Dan Taylor bursting through and that took him down time. for a loss of three. Let's That's go down to the sideline. Tayton Brader is with us. Well, Terry Denoma, class of 71, doesn't want to admit that he was a Fiji as the purple men running around the stands. <laughs> or pledge trainer. <laughs> but uh, things have changed just a little bit. You were a pretty busy man when you played football here. Uh, we used to go both ways and try to stay close. We never had the privilege of beating Mama, so we were, I came down to uh, try to help get that accomplished today. Tell me about playing Monmouth. What do you remember most about those games? Uh, they were always pretty fierce, close contests, and uh, they were a lot of fun, and we still remember them. What did you take away from Knox College? A lot of bruises, a few broken bones, uh, a lot of good memories. Uh, Harley and Osher, uh, Topper Steinman, I think, is uh, sponsoring one of these groups right now, and I uh, 
he just got admitted to the Hall of Fame and topper high. <laughs> well, where are you at? What are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm in real estate and business, and uh, I'm coaching ninth grade basketball in my spare time now. What do you think about the game so far? How's it look? Uh, we better get going and start cheering them on here. Well, I'm sure you'll be in the stands helping to contribute to that cheer. Enjoy the rest of the game. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Bye. Brad? Thank you, Kate. John Wozniak made the completion, and the officials bring out the chains and mark it on a first down. Shane Wetter underthrew it just a bit, but Wozniak made it happen just enough for the first down at the Monmouth 38-yard line. You know, I've noticed a number of his throws have been a little bit behind his receivers. I'm wondering if he does have something physically that's, that's making that happen a little bit. You know, they were talking about the Fijis and how he, he's not boasting about the guys running around there without their shirts on, but the Fijis were out here guarding the field to make sure that... Uh, that uh, nobody from Monmouth came over to paint the field like Knox did over at Monmouth last year, although something right? else happened. But uh, I guess it was kind of a 24-hour vigil for the last three or four days to make sure that, that Monmouth didn't get any revenge by painting the Knox Bowl. My no gain on first down for my the guess it, was, it was probably the pledges that were having to do that, but were my guess. I'll bet those aren't the pledges running around doing this. <laughs> no. Now second and ten. At the offset eye, Hayden and Stufflebeam in the backfield. And now back to pass, Kane Wetter on second and down. Across the middle, oh, Stufflebeam drops it. Rather, that was Wozniak right into the numbers. And it's tough to catch a ball when the wind chill is only 30 degrees. Great protection again. Had a lot of time to throw the ball. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That's one that should be caught. Still would have been about five yards short of the third down, of the first down rather, but now third down and 10 with 10.29 to play in the third quarter. Knox leading 14 to seven. And Matt Hayden's running has given the Prairie Fire some momentum. But after two straight plays of no gain, the Fire now facing third and 10. With Drew Sherman in the game in motion in the backfield. The stuff will be him out. Shane Wetter back to pass again. Throws it to Sherman at the 35 yard line. Inside the 30. And knocked out of bounds. And this will be close to another first down. I think he's got it. If it's inside the 33, he does. Yep. And it is. It's up to the 31. First down for the Prairie Fire. That was a well-designed play. Explode him out of the back. Yes. Very good. good throw. Sherman split out into the yep. flat. Nathan Johnson, the guy who came over and made the tackle, rather R.J. Haynes. And now first down for the Prairie Fire. Well, we saw Monmouth make all the third down conversions on the scoring drive back in the second quarter. Now Knox converts. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a confidence builder to get those third down conversions. Especially Ooh, on third and 10, an right initial there. hit at the wow. line of scrimmage, then Sherman kept on his feet. You could hear the helmets clash, and Sherman still managed to pick up two. There we go again. We approach the 10 minute off. mark of the, first, yep. of the third quarter, that rather. Good play. Good defensive play. Sometimes you, you wonder how those guys are even able to stay on their feet when they get hit like that. Now second and we'll call it eight. As Knox sends three wide outs to the far side. Hayden is the lone tailback with Ladeau split to the near side. Shane Weather looks to the far side and through the hands of Wozniak just short of the first down marker and almost picked off as Nate Bokholder came over and just about had it. And Wozniak had a tough day today. Yeah, yes. Um, you know, I can't compliment the offensive line enough, though. They've done a great job of protecting today. 9.39 to play third quarter. Now here's Knox again, second straight time, third and long. That'll be decision time, too, if they don't get this first down here, whether you go or whether you try to kick. And It would be about a 42-yarder, which is within Chris Warwick's range, and it's with the win. But let's see what they do on third and nine. Good protection again for Shane Wetter, oh, and he overthrows Wozniak at the five-yard line. Wozniak made a dive for it. But Shane Wetter just led him a little too much, and now here it is, as you said, John, decision time on fourth and nine. Again, drops back. Hayden gave a terrific block right at the line. That gave Shane Wetter a little extra time. Pretty good time, but he had a, a body in his face. I saw that. Now they're going for it. Prairie Fire huddling up on fourth and nine. And two wideouts to the far side. This time, Plaskis and Ladeau. Two wideouts to the near side, or Plaskis and Wozniak, rather. It's Shane Wetter in the shotgun. And a pitch forward to Hayden. Bobbles the ball. It's on the ground. And the officials rule an incomplete pass. And the Fighting Scots will take over on downs with 9.25 to play third quarter. 
a little pitch forward from Shane Wetter. Hayden juggled, couldn't control, and the officials rule it an incomplete pass, and the Monmouth takes over. As soon as it's dropped, the timing goes off, you allow the defense to, to catch up with it. Uh, initially, you know, it looked like there might have been some room there to run, but uh, as soon as the ball hits the ground, that's, that's trouble. You could see Hayden's head turn right as the ball came to his body, and he just didn't keep his eye on it long enough. So now Kevin Engeldow back in at quarterback. He started the game, and Coach Kelly Kane lifted him in the first half. Here's a handoff to Nathan Johnson. Skips a tackle at the line of scrimmage and up to the 35-yard line, and it looks to be enough for the first down. So that's, that's the best run we've seen from Nathan Johnson the entire game. That's Brock right. Noel over to finish him off. Getting that real fancy. Yeah, Johnson trap. gained only 15 yards in the first half on eight carries. He picked up 11 there, and really it was his own man who took him down. Now first down from the Knox 36-yard line. Engeldow calling off the shouts, now under center, Dwayne English. Hand off to the left side. Johnson could go nowhere that time as the Prairie Fire Purple Jerseys came bursting through Matt Hannum with the initial hit out of Roma High School here in Knox County. And let's see where they're going to spot it. Johnson loses two, and it'll be second and 12. Well, this is such a fun place to watch a football game in this bowl. It's really one of the more unique perspectives on really any level of football. With the game sunken down from the crowd in the natural bowl. Engeldow under pressure, oh, a takes a pressure. rock hit in the backfield as he tried to pass it off to Gentry Tate on the far side. Nate Wilson came through untouched on that play. There's that offensive line breaking down earlier like it, like it was against Absolutely. when Engeldow was in there the first time. Yeah, you, you wonder if Knox has gone back to doing some more of those things. I heard Coach Gibbons at the end of the half of things that he wanted to try to do with the defense and get him settled down a little bit and uh, get some pressure on the quarterback. That always helps. So one of the things, as we told you earlier, that Knox was really worried about coming into the game was those quick passes from Engeldow. They thought he does that very well, and they needed to put the pressure on him to prevent him from doing that. Now back to pass again across the middle, complete at the 45-yard line, Gentry Tate. But he's going to be a little over a yard short of the first down. And with the ball spotted at the Monmouth 45-yard line, can't believe... Coach Kelly Kane will go for it here. Nope. So here comes the punting unit. Here comes the replay. Yeah, let's see. Pretty good protection. Oh, looks like here came six. the pressure from the back side, right. but he got it off in time. And a good sure tackle right there, and that's the difference. Brock it, Noel made the hit. He missed that tackle. It's first down. Here comes John Bikey for the punt. Knox almost got a hand on it last time. Less of a rush oh, this boy. time, and a terrible punt. Terrible punt. Very short and out of bounds inside the Knox 40-yard line. And the officials are walking it up, and they're going to spot it all the way up to the 47. Terrific field position for the Prairie Fire. That was a pretty good defensive series there. Uh, put some good pressure on the quarterback and uh, you know, a good short tackle there to keep him from getting the first down. Now it's 7.37 to play third quarter. The Prairie Fire take over, leading 14-7. to seven. Now the offense has got to kind of get back on sync. Uh... Ladeau splits out to the near side. Two wide outs to the right are Wozniak and Plaskis. Stuffel being the man in motion is the lead blocker for Hannum. Skips over, or for uh, rather, Hayden, and he skips over them for a gain of a couple very close to the 50-yard line. Stuffel beam on the lead block. Knocked down Robert Cassidy, and Hayden just hurdled them. That's all something as a coach you kind of cringe at. You don't want your kids to jump and leave, <laughs> leave, their, leave their feet. It's a real different style when Hayden has the ball as opposed to when Stufflebeam carries. Sure. Stufflebeam hasn't carried the ball a whole lot today, as Hayden has gotten most of the work and has better than 100 yards rushing to show for it today. Hayden again across the left side. And up close to a first down, and we've got a late flag. Hayden looks like he's probably about a yard short of the first down marker across the Monmouth 45-yard line and a hold at the end of the play against Knox. So what would have been third and one is now looking at now, let's see second and see 11. Now, I don't know if we're going to see the hold. The flag came in very late. Yeah, did. Boy, I don't see him. 
Unless it was just outside it's of just the screen somewhere. It. Yeah, yep. So the hold takes it back to now second and 15, back at the Knox 42-yard line. We have under seven minutes to play in the third quarter, with Knox leading 14 to seven. Once again, we want to thank the Siwash Athletic Club for making this possible today. This really all came together with, uh, within about a month, a little over a month, and uh, get a hold of the Siwash Athletic Club, and thank you for bringing them this, uh, thank, thank them for bringing you this nationally televised game today. Second and 15, Shane Wetter drops back on a long drop, and caught right at the 50-yard line by Vince Annell, who caught the touchdown pass earlier, Ken Logan over to make the tackle. They'll spot it in Monmouth territory, just short of the 49-yard line, so now Knox looking at a third and six. Third and six, a lot more manageable than a third and 15. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We'll call out the plays from the sideline, and now let's see what the Prairie Fire do with two wideouts to the near side. Our Annal and Ladeau, two wideouts to the far side. Plaskis and Wozniak, Hayden, the lone man in the backfield. Blocks for Shane Wetter, throws it across the middle, and Wozniak can't hang on. Wouldn't have been enough for a first down anyway. And now the Prairie Fire will give it up on down. Shane Wetter got a lot of time again. He's had terrific time all, all game long. A little bit behind him. But like you said, I don't think that would have gotten a first down anyway. And a nice defensive play by Monmouth just to reach in and tap it away. John Wotena standing at his own 36-yard line to punt this one away. Back to take the kick for the Fighting Scots. Andrew Tyra standing on the far side. The punt is away. Good High punt. spinning kick with the wind. And Tyra calls fair catch back inside the pen. Wow. What a terrific punt from Joe Otena. And the Prairie Fire will try to stop this now with Monmouth starting from their own nine-yard line. And a great chance for the defense here to really stick Monmouth back as uh, the Fighting Scouts will try to move into the wind here. As you see, it was still 542, so a lot of time to play in the third quarter if the, if the defense can stiffen. They could come away with great field position by holding Monmouth to a three and out. Well, I'd, I'd, I would think Monmouth would come back with a little option with this in this drive at some point. Uh, I don't know if they want to pitch the ball down at this end of the field, but angled out yes. back to pass on first down into the wind has a man open and through oh, the hands boy. of Adam Tyra, a, just a perfect pass from Engeldow. Craig Roscoe was the defender. But somehow Andrew Tyra came down and got a step on him and made a leaping grab and then just threw his hands as he came down. That was a well-thrown ball. Really, the coverage wasn't all that bad either, to tell you the truth, and, and uh, just he couldn't come down with it. Play in from the sideline. Now second and 10 from the Monmouth nine-yard line. 5.35 to play third quarter. And the Knox players running, sir, the Knox fans running circles around the Monmouth fans in kilts at the far end zone. The handoff goes to the left side, and again, the defense stacks it up and pushes it backwards as Nathan Johnson went nowhere, maybe a gain of a yard. And now the fighting shots looking at third and long. Ryan Kennedy with the initial hit. Yeah. Good swarming defense. A lot of purple shirts around the ball. Well, you could get a lot of momentum back right here, John. Absolutely. If the defense can hold and force a punt into the wind, and now... The Prairie Fire on the field. Josh Fordyce pumping the arms in the air, trying to get the crowd to come alive. Everybody's hands are in their pockets right now. <laughs> Nobody wants to take their hands out in 30-degree wind chill. Nathan Johnson, the lone setback. Engel now on the keeper with Johnson, the lead blocker. Throws it to the oh. sideline and a diving attempt, but incomplete pass. And there's the defense. They give up just a yard on three plays. And here comes the punting unit. And look at where Drew Sherman and Ben Van Blera are going to take this punt. They're standing at the Monmouth between the 40 and the 45 yard line. So they're anticipating terrific field position here. It was a rollout and uh, just, I think the ball might have slipped coming out of his hand because it didn't look like it had a good rotation on it when he threw it. So the punt from John Dyke, a little bit of pressure, a low kick, a spinning kick and a good one. Sherman takes it over the shoulder at the 50. Now rolling laterally to the near side, trying to cut up field. Up to the 40-yard line, it steps out of bounds between the 35 and the 40-yard line. Let's go down to the sidelines with Caden Brader. 
Professor Gary Francois has seen a lot of football games at Knox College. I understand there's only one person in the staff that's been here longer than you. One person on the faculty, yes, Harley Nosher. So you I came in September of 63. And since then, uh, you must have developed quite an affinity for Knox football to be out on a day like this. For football, basketball, baseball, um, all of them. And over the years, I've seen several. Well, a professor of psychology has to be able to give us a psychological profile of today's <laughs> game. How would you assess it? I would say, rather than make it formal and everything, it's a lot of fun. It's a typical Knox Monmouth game. A uh, lot of enthusiasm, and Jim and Vern ought to be thanked for what they've done. It's great to have you here. Enjoy the rest of the game. Oh, I plan to. I'm going to try to keep warm. Thank you. Jim Valentine and uh, Vern Sisser is who Gary was referring to. And I'll tell you what, John, if you had to guess on what, guess one person who had been here longer than him, uh, I, I think probably everybody in the, in the place would guess it would have to have been Harley Dozier. That's exactly right. Matt Hayden on the run across the right side of the line for a gain of about five on second down. Jay Gunning with the hit. Rather, Hugo Herrera, the outside linebacker. And now third and about half the distance to go to get the first down. Well, not as good of a spot as I thought it was going to be. No, that's right. 34-yard line, so now they're looking at third and seven. Now here again, you, I would think they need to get a little more before they try a field goal here on the first down anyways. Double beam in the offset eye with Hayden in the backfield. Fake handoff to Hayden. Shane Wetter rolling out. Terrific protection again looking downfield. And he just tries to flip it to Stufflebeam standing at the 30-yard line. And Monmouth knocks it down. Dan Taylor swipes it away. And now fourth and seven for the Prairie Fire from the 34-yard line. And you're right, John. That would be about a 51-yard field goal. And even with the win, I'm right. not sure if Knox will want to try to attempt that. 3.17 to play third quarter. And Knox still holding that one touchdown lead, which it's been since with about five minutes to play before halftime. Joe Lotena standing at his own 48-yard line, and he'll try to pooch this one inside the 10. High kick. The wind will take that one downfield. Oh, rolls inside boy. the end zone. Boy, that was close. I don't think that uh, Andy Honecker expected that ball to skip like it did. <laughs> no. Number 27 standing there was waiting for the ball to come down and see how it landed. As soon as that ball hit, it was like a golf ball on pavement. It just zoomed into the end zone, and Honecker really never had a chance to react to knock it down. Well, it's always going to take that weird bounce, too. Uh, it's one of the things that makes this game such a great game. So Monmouth takes over from the 20-yard line. 3-10 to play third quarter. And this may be their last drive into the wind for the day. As we'll switch, switch sides, of course, at the end of the quarter. And Monmouth will have the wind after that. Let's see what they can do into the wind. They keep it on the ground with the end around. Gentry Tate coming in from the far slot position for a gain of four up to the 24 before the purple jerseys converge. And we're under three minutes to play in the third quarter. Craig Roscoe over to make the hit. And here's your replay. Okay. Defense slides the one way. Good play. Good lead blockers. Kind of tripped over his own feet there, looked like, or his, his blocker. Looks like Roscoe got out and maybe got a finger on his shoelaces yep. or something. As Roscoe was going down, it just instinctively stuck that right arm out, and that was enough to trip up Gentry Tate. Two in the slot. Alone setback is Nathan Johnson. With Kevin Engeldow under center. Now Tate in motion, and we've got flag. Just as the play gets off. Delay of game on yeah. the Fighting Scott. Oh, that's just a backbreaker. <laughs> Those mistakes are the ones that just add up, and as a coach, just drive you crazy. Well, when you talk about the, the difference in the games, like we talked about earlier, one of the big differences was Monmouth in the first quarter. Three turnovers, all the penalties, then they got things going, and, and none of those things obviously happened. Even the penalties uh, never really happened, and now here that they're struggling again in the third quarter, that's right. here come the penalties back. So it's now second and 11 for the Fighting Scots as they march it backwards to the 19-yard line. Johnson again, the lone setback. That's Paul Smith split out wide to the near side. Fake handoff now. Out of the slot comes John Turnquist across the left side of the line, and he gets back to the 20-yard line. A lot of running for a gain of a yard, and now third and 10 for the Fighting Scots. You know, the daylight is 
ending earlier now with the uh, daylight saving time ending last weekend and the crowd looks colder. A couple couple players make the hit. I believe it was I believe it was uh, Craig Roscoe again who got him from the leg and took him down. So now third and a long nine to go. They're looking like they're bringing pressure. Here they come. Fake oh, handoff. Josh Fordyce. Extremely well. Boy, oh boy. Josh Fordyce across the left side of the line and a late flag. Fordyce came bursting through, angled out, never had a chance. Now let's see what the flag is. Oh, that's an unsportsmanlike that's an conduct. Unsportsmanlike call. Unbelievable. Fordyce was in there celebrating after making the sack on Engeldow. And he almost wondered if that's what it had to have been because uh, it, it, you the never way know the if he said something, but I sure, it just looked like he was pretty happy about making a play, you know. Uh, that's it, that's it. Oh, uh, well, are they going to call it for throwing him down like he did? Well, see now, see, now the flag, you see there, the official is just reaching for the flag, so they give it to him for celebrating. That's, a bad, that's, that's not a good call. And he wasn't taunting his opponent. He was just excited. I mean, when you take the excitement away from the kids. Well, and he was looking to the home side oh, of the field. Absolutely. He wasn't, he wasn't absolutely. looking at the opponents at all. Yeah, that. So now it's first down. From the 25-yard line, they march it forward 15 yards from where the play ended. So now Monmouth with, with a new series of downs from the 25-yard line. What a bad break for the Prairie Fire. Here's Gentry Tate coming from the left slot position. And tackled from behind, Craig Roscoe makes the shoulder dive at the ankles. And that prevents a first down, at least for the time being, as Tate gains seven. We're down to a minute to play, third quarter. Here we go. It, it almost looks like the, uh, J Tate seems to be running with a little more energy after that last play. I right. mean, he really had a good burst of speed coming from the left side of that line. So if you're Coach Andy Gibbons for the Prairie Fire, you sure hate to think that uh, that penalty oh, that, is just yeah. going to fire up Monmouth now, but uh, at least on that play, that's what it seems to have done. Second and three now. Angle now, the handoff to Johnson with a little misdirection across the middle. Still on his feet into the secondary and finally tripped up and taken down. Craig Roscoe there to uh, trip him up. Josh Fordyce finished him off, but it's into first down territory up to the Monmouth 44-yard line. When the clock will run, they may get one more playoff as we're under 30 seconds to play in the third quarter. And that's a trap. And gets away from the ankle tackle. And then here's the one. He breaks this tackle right here. That, that's a tackle that should have been made. So Johnson takes it up. The knee comes down at the 44 and first down for the Fighting Scots. We're down to 12 seconds in the third quarter. This will be the last play of the period. Angle now under pressure in the backfield, but he got the handoff to Johnson into ball. territory. Oh. The ball on the ground. Oh no! And the officials say the ball, the uh, ground caused the fumble. So Monmouth with another first down inside Knox territory now at the 44-yard line, and the player slow to get up is Craig Roscoe. He's had a big game today, and that's tough to see. They spot the ball actually at the 43. Johnson Let's with a see. huge hole up the middle. Yep, the ball, the, the ground did cause that. And it looks like uh, Roscoe just kind of rolled over on his leg. So we've come to the end of the third quarter with Knox still leading by a single touchdown, 14 to 7. We'll take a timeout. You are watching a special broadcast of Knox College football made possible by the efforts of the Siwash Athletic Club. filled with twists and turns. Handle it. Dunlop Tires. This plant is a rich source of natural vitamin E. This plant uses that source to make enough vitamin E to meet the daily requirement of nearly 450 million people. This is a soybean plant. 
And this is an Archer Daniels Midland Vitamin E plant, where soybeans are used to produce natural vitamin E, officially recognized to have 36% greater potency than synthetic vitamin E. Two very different plants, one very essential vitamin. Another reason why ADM is supermarket to the world. The people of the frozen north have over 30 different ways to describe snow. Luckily, we found two words that handled them all. John Deere. Ask your John Deere dealer about our full line of snowblowers now. Ready to start the fourth quarter with Knox leading Monmouth 14 to 7. And that dog apparently belongs to Nate Wilson, the linebacker. Well, the momentum has definitely changed here. Maybe one of the biggest fans in the place. Knox jumps. Angled out back to pass. Under a little bit of pressure. Now rolling right. Escapes one tackle. Gets another good block. Launches it downfield. And it's intercepted inside the five-yard line. Brock Noel came over to pick it off. And what started, what looked like it was starting as a tough play when Knox jumped on the right side of that defensive line. Here's a replay. No offside. See, there it is, right there. Got back. Now. Now he's under pressure. He's He'll under get a good block right there. Allows him to free up. And then overcomes Noel. And takes it at the five and then steps out at the three. Well, I would think you'd see a little... Matt Hayden and Ryan Stufflebeam right here to get yourself some, some breathing room. You know, that was Monmouth's first play with the win since changing sides. You think they did? They think maybe Engled out forgot to take that into consideration? First down from the three, and Shane Wetter just on a keeper tries to get up to the five yard line and get a little bit of running room. About the safest play you can run down there. Well, we and now a late flag, and maybe this will be on Monmouth. It, it looked like somebody gave Shane Wetter a shove right at the end. Kind of hard to tell from this angle. Hey. And let's see what it is. Oh. Another unsportsmanlike, and this one's against Knox, too. Second unsportsmanlike conduct against the Prairie Fire and about the last minute and a half on the clock. Go back to Monmouth, he's so that will not make Coach Andy Gibbons very happy. No, that's a critical one there. So the ball half the distance back to the goal line. Empty. So the uh, the actual yardage amount of the penalty doesn't hurt, but the loss of down certainly does. It's second and 11 now. Matt Hayden lined up at the tailback position is about four yards deep in the end zone. He'll take the handoff across the right side, tries to squirm his way across the line and looks to get across the five. Just Another Hugo Herrera with the tackle. We are just underway in the fourth quarter. We've been at 14 to seven for a long time. The Knox Prairie Fire scored the first two of the game on a touchdown pass back in the first quarter from Shane Wetter to Vince Annald and Matt Hayden ran one in for five yards to make it 14 to nothing. The backup quarterback Josh Boyer rallied the fighting Scots with about five minutes to go before halftime on a touchdown pass to a wide open Andrew Tyra, and that's where we've been ever since. Shane Wetter on a fade down the sideline to a go and through his hands at the 32. So now, fourth down, and Knox will have to punt, and this one into the win. So, Joe Wotenis, work is cut out for him here. Lado was open, he got a couple steps on his man, and a great pass from Shane Wetter into the win. Just off the fingertips, oh boy. Just let him a little too much. Wotena standing a yard away from the back end zone line. Standing at the 42 yard line, Adam Tyra, along with John Beike. Tyra will take it and escape one tackle and then a nice hit. As Andy Honecker prevented a big return. If Tyra gets past Honecker, that one could go for a while. But instead, the Scots will take over. Still terrific field position at the Knox 39. 13-39 to play in the game. 
And Engel now will try to take the Scots into the end zone to try to tie this game up. Knox looking for its third straight winning season and its third straight win over Monmouth in the bronze turkey game. The defense with its work cut out for it here. From the 39, Engel now back to pass on first down. Just a little screen to the right side. Tyra with the catch up to the 35 for a gain of four on first down. And there's that quick passing game again that Andy Gibbons was concerned about. Craig Roscoe makes the tackle. And somehow, hey, how did Monmouth get a hold of the Knox flag? <laughs> that shouldn't happen. Hopefully that's not an indication of things to come. And here come the Fijis back to reclaim their property. <laughs> and the Monmouth, the Monmouth fans, seeing that they're outnumbered, just hand it over. Second and six, a little end around from the far side. John Turnquist gets past another tackle inside the 35-yard line for a gain of a couple more. And now on a third and four, John O'Neill with the tackle. Coming out of the cornerback spot. And the clock continues to run. Monmouth think... Yeah, they seem to think they found something outside. I think they're really a lot of things coming back and trying to get outside. Could have gone for even more, except it looked like Turnquist just got a little ahead of his blocker. That's right. Monmouth has to get to the Knox 29-yard line for a first down. The ball spotted between the 32 and the 33. Two in the slot, the lone setback is Nathan Johnson. Johnson with the hand off straight up the middle, and that went nowhere. Knox read it beautifully and took Johnson down for a loss. And a guy who we expected to uh, be one of the key players for the Fighting Scots today has had a tough day on the ground. Josh Fordyce and Ryan Kennedy with the stop. Had a uh, couple of nice carries in that last drive, but yeah, you're right. It's been a long afternoon for him. The ball at the 35-yard line, and now Monmouth in a punting situation. Comes a field position issue now. John Bikey standing back, you know, right about the midfield strike. Drew Sherman and Ben Ben Vlera standing at the 10. The time will try to down this one inside the 10, and he boots it toward the corner. Sherman lets it go, and it spins out of bounds. That's a four. That's a four-yard line. That's another good punt. So Knox started the last drive from the three and couldn't get anything going. Now they'll start this one from the four with 11.34 to play in the game. Well, this becomes a composure issue, too, now. I think Knox, that last time, seemed to lose their composure a little bit after those two penalties, and uh, they need to come out and reestablish themselves a little bit. We'll give a different look here with Drew Sherman coming in. Dave Shanewetter back in to try to engineer a, a long scoring drive here. Don DeBrita in as well as he just ran the play in from the sideline. Now Hayden, the lone step back in the backfield with Ladeau out wide right. Oh, Another fade to pass to him, and he overthrew everybody that time. As the lone defender down was R.J. Haynes, and he had a better chance at it than Ladeau did. So 11 and a half minutes to play in the game, and the Prairie Fire from the four-yard line you know, really, if they can just chew some clock off here, John. Just, That's right. You know, even if they can just get Couple it out. first downs. Yeah, just get it away from the goalpost and take some time off the clock and put a lot more pressure on Monmouth, even if you do give the ball back to them. Hand off to Hayden across the right side. Still on his feet as he tried to cut back to the middle and take him down short of the 10. Looks to be a gain of about four on second down. So now third and six. Quite likely a passing situation as Jim Hardesty makes the stop on Matt Hayden. And give the Monmouth defense a lot of credit. They've prevented any big runs from Matt Hayden here in the second half. He, I think he had one earlier. They've kept him pretty well bottled up. That's right. Nothing big like he had in the first half, though. Hayden was really kind of the story of the first half. As he was doing most of the work on the ground. Now third and six. Handoff again to Hayden. Running laterally. Gets past an ankle tackle. Now cuts back toward the middle. Got past the block. Into first down territory. He's free. Down to the 40. We have a foot race. Into the territory, inside the 40-yard line before he's first out of bounds. It's just to be confident the the defense for stopping Matt Hayden. What a run he makes Boy. as he cuts back, cuts back to the middle. Let's uh, hope we get a chance to see that one again. That one, <laughs> there we go. Watch this is just some great individual effort. Because things aren't happening right here. And there's a great one to break the ankle tackle. Now he cuts all the way back across. Two big blocks right oh, there by the offensive just... line. And then it's a foot race. And finally taken down as R.J. Haynes comes over to force him out. 
and the Prairie Fire have it at the Monmouth 36-yard line. I formation, shuffle beam, the lone man up front, Drew Sherman in a tailback as Hayden's getting a breather here and Sherman across the left side of the line picks up close to three on first down. A well-deserved breather. <laughs> Could be the, uh, the play that if the Prairie Fire can hang on and win this one now, we may look back at that play right there, John. That's right. So, you know, big players make big plays at, at, at times that it's needed. John Dwyer from the inside linebacker spot came over to stop Sherman on that first carry. Dwyer, a guy we weren't even sure was going to play today, but uh, being a senior, he wasn't about to miss this uh, Knox Monmouth game. He's been nursing a bum ankle and apparently had not practice all week long. Sherman again across the left side. and Sherman's another guy, a very similar runner to Hayden. Sherman just a sophomore, and I'll tell you, when you can, when you can take Hayden out and come back with a guy who runs so much like him, that's a tremendous advantage. You don't lose much. Matt Russell with the hit. Well, and the thing that's going to help him is he's he's been around this this Matt Hayden for two years. Uh, you pick things up from a, from a good player, and uh, that's just going to help him in the next two years as well. Offset eye on third and five. Stuff will be in the fullback. Two wideouts to the right. Chain letter back to pass. Looks across the middle and throws between Wozniak and Stuffelbeam. Wozniak looked to be the intended receiver, and he never really had a chance at it. So now fourth and a long five for the Prairie Fire from the Monmouth 31-yard line. And like we said, John, even if you punt here, and look, well, Monmouth, or, uh, Knox is going to stay in and go for it. Now the crowd comes to life a little bit. That Matt Hayden run really woke everybody up. Yeah, it did. More importantly, more than anything else, Knox took it out from deep inside its own territory. That's right. Regardless of what happens here. On fourth and a long five, offset nine. Shane Letter back to pass again. Gets good protection. Has Wozniak downfield. Now tackle from behind. John Carruthers finally broke free from a block in the backfield and ankle tackled. Dave Shane Letter from behind and the Fighting Scots take over at their own 35-yard line. But even with uh, even with no score, a uh, mission accomplished. It took time off the clock and got it out from deep inside their own territory. There he gets away from the running back. And Shane Weather never had a had a clue. So let's see what Coach Kelly Kane's Monmouth Fighting Scots can do now. First and 10 from their own 35-yard line. From the slot position, John Turnswift cuts it upfield for a gain of four. As over to make the tackle comes Brent Becker. Becker, another senior, playing his final game here before the home crowd. Up to the 39-yard line, a gain of four for a turn twist. Monmouth has really gone to those uh, slot positions a lot today, John. That's we, right. You know, we really thought maybe Nathan Johnson would get a lot more carries, but the Knox defense is keyed so well on Johnson that it maybe it's freed up a lot more for Turnquist and Tate coming out of the slot spot. That's Tate in motion. They hand off. No, angle down on the keeper. Now pitches to Tate into the backfield. First down into Knox territory inside the 50 and pushed out of bounds. Curly Vineyard got a hand on him. And the official spots the ball inside Knox territory at the 46-yard line. And there's that option that has caused so much trouble for Knox in the last five games. And this guy does a great job. He does a great job running the ball. Really, if he's able to keep his balance, could have gone farther. Tate has had a big game on the ground for Monmouth. He's only a sophomore. In fact, Monmouth starts six sophomores on offense. Hand off to Johnson, straight up the middle it goes, up to the Knox 41-yard line for a gain of about five. Nate Wilson on the tackle out of Dunlap, the defensive player of the week in the Midwest Conference last week. As Knox got down early up at Coe and fell behind 21 to nothing in about the first eight minutes, and then the defense shut the Cohawks down the rest of the way, but the offense couldn't rally, and Knox fell 21 to 14 in a game that Andy Gibbons said was it's about his, the best team the defense has played all year long, despite that start. Now second and five. Hand off to Tate coming in out of the slot again. Big running route into the secondary, into first down territory, down to the 30-yard line. Craig Roscoe with the tackle. Well, Knox is 
Tate really becoming the big star for Monmouth here in the fourth quarter. Well, and Knox's defense, as we were talking about Monmouth in the first half, Knox's defense has been on the field a long time this half. And just like Knox moved it out of the shadow of its own goalpost on that big Matt Hayden run, now here it comes. Right back toward the end zone again. Monmouth to the 30-yard line. And on the move. Hand off to Tate again. And tackled that time in a good pursuit by Josh Fordyce as he came bursting through the right side of the defensive line. Just ran right over the left side of the Monmouth offensive line and wrapped up Tate from the ankles. And it looks like he lost a couple feet. Yeah, that was a great defensive play there. We are past the midpoint of the fourth quarter. Knox still clinging to a single touchdown lead, 14 to seven. And this is exactly the kind of game Monmouth needed to have a chance to win. Having scored 17 points just once this season, that was its season high. Hand off to the left side and nowhere to go for Nathan Johnson. Let's go to the sidelines, Peyton Brader. Well, these guys, Jim Valentine, class of 61, and Jim Adams, right next to me, class of 88, were not only both lettermen here at Knox College, but also responsible for getting Knox football on television this afternoon. Jim, how'd you get mixed up in all of this? Well, I was uh, the one that was not, was frightened after realized it couldn't be done. The, this gentleman right next to me and Vern Sisser is out there watching us right now. They, re they weren't bright enough to realize that this could not be done, so they deserve all the credit. I'm just a mere technical guy. What do you remember most about playing at Knox? Um, just the fun. All the fun. The camaraderie. And are you enjoying the game so far? Great. Just a little cold. Well, I know one man <laughs> enjoying it thoroughly, regardless of the cold, is Jim Valentine, who has worked uh, tirelessly to get this thing put on the air. You have to feel a little proud of this day, regardless of the score. Yeah, I'm really excited about the day and the event, and I'm just so happy that all the alums can get plugged back into the college. But I also want to say a couple words about the people who have spent so much time and effort on this thing, and there are a lot of them. Jim Adams here right next to me, but Vern Stisser, Iggy Matkoff, Max Usler, and countless other people, particularly all the 32 hosts throughout the United States that have taken their time and effort to put this event on in their local towns really makes me excited. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, you've done a fine job. Now we have to leave the rest in the hands of the players on the field. Brad? Thank you, Kate. And a penalty on first, on rather third down. Takes Monmouth down to a third and five at the Knox 25-yard line. Angled out a pass, man open, caught, and a first down at the 15-yard line as Andrew Tyra hauled it in. And the Monmouth drive continues and another third down condition, conversion for the Fighting Scott. Well, again, that, that penalty makes it a, a manageable play. All right, here we go. It's a good catch. That's just a great concentration grab there. Yeah, it was really tremendous defense by Craig Roscoe. And Tyra had to go high, and that was all by his hands. That wasn't into the numbers. He went high for that catch. And now first down from the Knox 15-yard line. Under six minutes to play in the game. Engel now rolling out, tosses it to the end zone, and he threw it away. Tyra, the intended receiver, was under double coverage, and Engel now did a good job. He, the nice thing about the way he threw that, John, was that if anybody was going to catch it, it was going to be his man. Otherwise, that was it. Or a kid sitting on the side of the bowl. Yeah. <laughs> 5.53 to play in the game, still 14 to seven in favor of the Prairie Fire. Second down from inside the Knox 15 yard line. Engel now brings his team set. Nathan Johnson, the lone setback, wide outs one to each side. Pitch into the backfield, it goes to Kernquist in motion out of the slot, avoids an ankle tackle in the backfield and three players converge. One of them being Josh Fordyce, whose name we've called a lot today. Also there, coming up out of the free safety spot, Brock Noel. And what are they going to say? A gain of, well, about two. Okay, so it's now it. third and eight from the 13. This is a big play right here. Monmouth wants this into the end zone. With under six minutes to play, they don't want to settle for a field goal and then have to take their chances. They want to tie this game up. 5.45 to play in the game. Wide left goes Paul Smith. Wide right is Adam Tyra. Flag as the play gets off and big time tackle in the backfield. Engeldow goes down hard as Stephen Rook 
came through and forced him down. We got a flag Let's down. see what the flag is. Again. Would have been a loss of seven. It's offsides on Knox. So it'll go from third and eight to third and three. And that's, like you said, John, that's how they were able to convert the last third that's down a, That makes it a much more manageable play, that's for sure. Three yards is a lot easier to get. It gives you more options, too. Yeah. Uh, third and third and eight or third and you know 15, as that would have been. You almost have to pass third and three. If you can draw up the right kind of running play, all you need is three yards. And Monmouth has certainly gained a lot of this yardage after starting back here at the Fighting Scots 35-yard line. It's gained a lot on the ground coming out of those slot positions this time in the traditional wishbone with johnson the up man handoff to gentry tate across the right side of the line and this is going to be very close tate had to get to the five yard line and really across the five and depending on where the spot is well this is this is going to be close the officials just set the ball down short of the five okay. yard line if that's if that's the case it's not enough and they're not even going to make it and here's an indication of what Coach Kelly Kane wants. He's going for it on fourth and a yard from the Knox six. Inside the six-yard line, five minutes to play with a one-touchdown difference right now. Again, the wishbone set with Johnson, the up man. Angle now hands off. It goes to Johnson. He tries to dive across the line, and then the defense pushes everybody backwards. They fake to Johnson, actually, and it went to Gentry Tate. And no first down. Knox has it back. Wow, what a what a defensive play. Oh my goodness. Look at where the ball is sitting. Boy, oh right boy. On the five yard line. That's uh boy. I don't think it could be much closer. No. Here's a replay. Gentry Tate. He's been the workhorse this half. Boy. What's the number underneath that pile right there? I'm trying to get a look. Our spotter, Jason Bruning, says it was Stephen Roke who wrapped him up, and Boy. then Ryan Kennedy came out of the linebacker wow. position. That's just a great defensive play. As Gentry was still on his feet, and Kennedy finished him off. First and 10 from the Knox 5 with under five minutes to play. Matt Hayden back in and stopped right at the line of scrimmage. So it'll be second down and long. Well, you know, here's the challenge. The clock, Monmouth's biggest enemy right now, John, but uh, Knox needs to get a first down or two to try to move the chains and take some time off the clock That's themselves right. or else uh, Monmouth stands to get the ball back in good position. Right. You gotta move the chains a couple times here. Hayden had that long run on the last possession and then sat out the rest of the play, the rest of the series as he got arrested back in there now at tailback with Stuffle being the fullback. Hand off to Hayden across the right side, now cutting laterally, stopped at the five yard line and then still works his way up to about the eight as Dan Taylor, the outside linebacker, came up to make the hit. And Knox in a tough spot now, facing third and seven from the eight-yard line with under four minutes to play. Well, this is what we said at the beginning of the day, John. All the offense that Knox has mustered this season, a 500 record. Monmouth College at just two and six, struggling so mightily offensively, but uh, the defense ranked near the top of the Midwest Conference all year long. But it's the Browns turkey game. And this is exactly what you would That's expect right. at this state of the game. Three and a half minutes to play. Here's Hayden on third and seven with a handoff. That'll be short of the first down. He had to get to the 15-yard line. He works his way up to about the 18. And now Knox will have to punt after taking only about a minute 20 off the clock. Well, we haven't seen Monmouth put the rush on the punt all day. You almost wonder if Coach Kelly Kane will give it a try here and try yeah, to make a be. big play. You know, at some point, yeah. Votena standing a yard deep in the end zone. Back to take the kick. Andrew Tyra. A low spinning kick, a short kick, and Monmouth just falls on it at the 41-yard line as Brian Hetrick came up to take it. So good position with 2.50 to play in the game. Under three minutes to go, Monmouth with the first down from the Knox 41-yard line. Well, if there's any advantage to the cold weather today, John, as much as the Knox defense has been on the field, if it were an 80-degree day, yeah. they'd really be wiped Absolutely. out right now. Yep, that's right. Well, the defense coming off a big stop. The offense goes three and out, but the defense had a big stop on fourth and one from the six-yard line. Let's see if that four-man front 
and everybody else in the purple jerseys can continue that defensive momentum now. Here's the fake, Engel now back to pass. He faked twice, good protection, a bullet pass across the middle, and he led Nathan Johnson too much, and it falls incomplete. Brock Noel came over to make the hit after the ball fell down, 2.44, and more importantly for Coach Kelly Kane, he'd, he'd want the conversion, but the clock does stop. Right. Both teams do have all their timeouts as well. Paul Smith runs the play in from the sideline. For Monmouth, out goes Tyson Royer. Wide to the right goes Andrew Tyron. To the near side comes Paul Smith. Second and 10 from the Knox 41-yard line. Turn twist in motion. Oh. Angle now wrapped up and taken down at the 50-yard line. D.J. Tracy of Alito High School came bursting through from his left tackle position and took Angle now down back at the 48-yard line. A loss of seven, and it's third and 17. Got a stunt on here. D.J. Tracy, number 57. Right here he comes. Boom. That's a big play. That is a big play. Brian Kennedy checks out from the linebacker spot. Nate Wilson back in for the Prairie Fire. Four-man defensive front. High formation with one to the slot right. Hand off to the right side. It goes to John Turnquist. Got some running room. And inside the 35-yard line, but it should it. Well, it's very close to a first down. He got tripped up short of the first down marker and stayed on his feet just long enough to stumble up to the first down marker. And we're going to have a measurement at the Knox 31. Brock Noel tripped him up. What a great run from John Turnquist to stay on his feet, maintain his balance long enough to give the Fighting Scots a chance here. The chains come out. And it's a first down for Monmouth. It's just the, the, old, the old draw play. And a huge hole across the right side yes. of the offensive yeah, line. Looks like an awfully generous spot. I don't know. You know Kelly Cade would have gone for it on fourth and one anyway, but That's it's all right. a moot point. It's first and ten from the Knox 31. Fighting Scott trailing by a touchdown with a minute 53 to play in the game. Engel now, back to pass on first down. A fade pass down the right side. They get caught up with each other, no. and here comes the flag. That's Craig the Roscoe flag as he tied up Adam Tyra down the far sideline. And another 15 yards will take it inside the Knox 16-yard line on another first down. Well, you know, let's take a look at this again. The I, officials are conferring. It looks, it they look both like had their eyes on down. the ball. He was, that's... Well, wow. maybe maybe it's offensive pass interference. Looks like Tyra got his hands on Roscoe's shoulders and kind of forced him down. Here comes the call. It's against Knox. And the crowd can't believe it. And the coaching staff is irate. You watch that play. Tyra gets his hands on Roscoe's shoulders. Here's another look at it. There's... That's, there it is. That's not a good call. He gets Roscoe by the helmet call. and takes him down. We have the benefit of the replay. The officials don't. They have to call it as it happens. The nose of the football is at the Knox 15-yard line with a minute 41 to play. And now the Knox defense trying to bring the crowd back to life. And we have a timeout. The officials... I'm trying to get everybody off the field here. And the fans take the opportunity to go down and tell the officials what they thought of that last call. So now we should be ready to go. A minute 41 to play. Still a one touchdown game. 14 to 7 is your score with the Fighting Scots driving with the aid of a 15-yard pass interference penalty inside the Knox 16. Adam Tyra, again, splits wide to the right. He's the guy who created the penalty last time. Paul Smith, wide to the left. It's the same formation. The officials talking things over with all the players. Now we're ready to play some football. 
Tate and Turnquist in the slot, left and right. Johnson, the lone setback, with Engel now under center. Both crowds have come to life. Hand off to Johnson, straight up the middle, goes nowhere. Gains maybe a yard, and the clock will roll. Now well, time a out. timeout. Monmouth calls timeout with a minute 32 to play in the game. And it'll be second and a long nine. C.J. Tracy again came up to make the to make the tackle, Ryan Kennedy helped finish him off. Well, it looked early, John, like it might be a blowout with Knox scoring the first two. On well, a pass play and a running play. They can look back and look at some missed opportunities, obviously, in that first half, but uh, it's just been a great ball game here in the second half. We're going to take one more look at the penalty. Here it is. Yeah, here's the Adam Tyra, the intended receiver. Well, to me, the defender's got his back to the ball or back to the defender looking at the ball. I don't see how you can call that. I, I just don't see that. Looks like Tyra got the left arm up on the shoulder and maybe even around the back of Craig Roscoe's helmet. But you what the gun is done. That's right. And the defense has to, has to hold now. Coming out of the Monmouth timeout. Save formation, and the Knox crowd comes to life in the defensive tier. The sidelines egging the home crowd on. Fake handoff, angle down on a keeper. Wrapped up and taken down, but he still manages to gain a yard. And it'll be third and long now for the Fighting Scots. Josh Fordyce again wrapped him up and held on for dear life. And the clock rolls with a minute 15 to play in the game. Here comes Nate Wilson back into the play. From the sidelines, we're down to one minute to go in the game. Monmouth on a third and nine from inside the Knox 15-yard line. Fake handoff, angled out of pass, under pressure, sack back at the 23-yard line. Ryan Kennedy came out of the linebacker spot and took him down. Uh, Monmouth calls timeout with 48 seconds to play. Oh, that's just a huge defensive play right there. Great coverage, too. You know, you can you can say what you want, but there was some great coverage on that play. We'll take another look at it. Ryan Kennedy, number 44. There he comes He's got some from the time. bottom of your screen. And Fordyce also there. Kennedy wrapped him up and give the secondary a lot of credit for covering the intended receivers downfield. Monmouth has burned its second time out and faces fourth and 17 from the Knox 22 and a half yard line. And the players on the field trying to pump the crowd back up and get the defensive cheers going. The battle for the bronze turkey has come down to this. Fourth and 17. Monmouth needs to get inside the five-yard line for a first down. It's 14 to seven Prairie Fire with 48 seconds to play. This senior-dominated offense wants to go out with a win. It would be the third straight winning season for the Prairie Fire. It would be the third straight win over Monmouth for the Browns Turkey. Here is your ball game. Fourth and 17 with Kevin Engel now, the quarterback for Monmouth. Back to pass and a short drop. Launches it to the end zone. Adam Tyra, falls yeah. incomplete. Engel now had him. Well, you know, you, you talk about the senior dominated offense, but it's really been the defense that stepped up here in the second half and played a great ball game. They've really held, you know, they've had some, they're back to the wall a number of times. Here's the throw. Really a pretty well thrown ball. It's a, that's a tough, just off the fingertips. Leads Adam Tyra just a little too much. And the Prairie Fire take over with 42.7 showing on the clock and a 14 to seven lead from the Knox 22 and a half yard line. Well, a valiant effort for Monmouth, uh, you know, uh, and again, the, the things that have plagued them all year, I think you look in this ball game, they haven't scored any more than 17 points in a ball game, uh, just ineffective at times. And Knox will just down the ball. Shane Witter takes the knee. And the clock will roll. Yep, Monmouth calls timeout. Yeah, Monmouth has one more timeout. And they burn it. So it stops the clock with 36 seconds to play. And now Coach Kelly Kane is out having a word with the officials. 
something he saw he certainly didn't like, and he's letting them know about it. So it'll just be a matter of finishing off the game now. Shane Wetter will simply have to take a knee. Monmouth has burned. It's third and final timeout. And you hear the crowd chanting, long ride home. 15 miles isn't that far, but after a tough loss like this, Boy, it, it certainly is. becomes you know, a long this ride This is a home. tough loss. It's a, it's a tough loss. Josh Fordyce celebrating on the sideline with athletic director Harley Nosher. The seniors love this. Just waiting to come out of Monmouth's final timeout. Well, this has been a great game to watch, I'll tell you that. It's lived up to all of the, the tradition and the... Well, Nashville have won its third straight game. And even more importantly, they will have tied up this all-time series. That's right. 49, 49, and 10 ties in 108 meetings between these two teams. And it's just a matter of running out the clock now as we come out of the final Monmouth timeout. By the way, Brad, what was the score of the first one? I know you were here. <laughs> uh, that was in a previous <laughs> life. Shane Wetter will take a knee. Down he goes, and it's just a matter of running the clock out now. 1891, the first meeting. Knox won it 22 to 4. Knox went 2 and 1 that year. Their only loss was to the University of Illinois. And now it's started to rain. So how's this for timing? We're well, coming to the end of the game, and the crowd will be able to go home before they get too wet. And of course, all of you folks watching around the nation, you're dry inside. We're down to nine seconds to play, and the crowd is on the field. Senior night, the bronze turkey, and the Knox Prairie Fire celebrate owning both of them. 14-7 to seven the final. The Prairie Fire finished the season 5-4, and four, their third straight winning season, and their second straight under head coach Andy Gibbons. The Monmouth Fighting Scots finished the year at 2-7. and seven. Boy, hard-fought game, no doubt about it. Both teams went scoreless in the second half as it was 14-7 to seven at halftime and just a tremendous defensive battle. Andy Gibbons was very complimentary of the Monmouth defense heading into this game today. Well, and the Knox and defense, nice which, which was maligned a little bit, I think yep. at, at times, uh, really stepped up and played well. Uh, the offense really was struggled uh, here in the second half. Caton Brader is down on the sidelines with uh, one of the heroes of today's game. Caton? Well, most of Knox's games have been won or lost in the second half. This one, no exception, but the man who's been there every step of the way, quarterback Dave, Shane Wetter, a very emotional game for you and a very stressful game, too. Is there a turning point? Um, you know, I think we came out and really settled down a little bit in the second half. I think all the seniors were just pressing a little too hard, knowing that uh, we are at home. It was our last game, and we all wanted to win so bad. I think we were playing a little too hard in the first half. So I think just the fact that we settled down and uh, Matt broke a couple big runs, and I think that really helped us out. You played with a lot of different players along the way, particularly in the last couple of years, but there was an additional player on the field indirectly. Explain the significance of the sticker on the back of your helmet. Uh, Probably the biggest influence in my life um, in terms of football is through my father. Um, he was my high school football coach, and he's always been my head coach all along. And so um, I called him up last week and told him this one's for him. Certainly made him proud. What will you take away from this game and from your experience at Knox? Um, three in a row against Monmouth. It's just fantastic. I don't know how long it's been since that's been done. And uh, I made a lot of great friends here and a lot of guys who just love football. And... Um, you know, didn't get that chance to play at Division One, and came here and really busted their butts and, you know, did the job. Well, Dave played for his father in high school, his high school coach. You've made an awful lot of coaches proud. Congratulations thank and continued much. success. Well, thank you. Brad? All right, Caden, thank you very much. Once again, the final 14-7. to 7, Dave Shanewetter, a guy who holds a number of career passing records here at Knox College. But uh, one of the things he did this season, set the career mark for passing touchdowns in a season when he did it last week. 44 and he got a 45th today which eclipsed the old record of 42 which Bob Monroe held back in 1984 and 87 
when he played here. Don, a great game. It's the bronze turkey. It's, it's what everybody expected, everybody anticipated. And there you see an emotional group of guys who really deserve this win here today, a hard-fought game. Well, you know, we've said all along, these, these are kids that, that play football because they love to play football. And uh, these are really truly what you would call the, the, the scholar-athlete that uh, are here to get an education but love to play the game. And, uh, you know, these kids, uh, it's the last time for a number of them. And yeah. uh, that, that's a big thing. It's, uh, that's a big part of their life. Last time Knox beat Monmouth three straight games in this series, 1979 to 1981, when they won 28 21, 13 to nothing, and 21 to 14. John, it's been a special pleasure working with you here today, and of course, we want to make a, a special thanks to the Knox Siwash Athletic Club for bringing you this game, and uh, to all the folks listening in and watching in around the country, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for celebrating a Knox win in the Bronze Turkey game. Once again, the final. 14 to 7 and your Prairie Fire finished the season 5 and 4 a third straight winning season. For John Allison, I'm Brad Benowitz and for all the production crew and for the Siwash Athletic Club, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Good afternoon. Well, I just like to again uh, thank the Siwash Athletic Club for its uh, very dedicated work to advancing athletics at Knox and to everyone who's uh, uh, participating in today's game uh, through this telecast and, and, and enjoying it and uh, uh, just uh, hope our, our record against Monmouth continues to uh, be a positive one. We're uh, look, looking for victory all the way. So, uh, and, and also have a open, uh, offer an open invitation to people to come back to campus at any time. Well, all of us associated with Knox hope that you enjoyed today's telecast, which, like you, I watched far from Galesburg. This is Mile High Stadium in Denver, home of the NFL Broncos. It's doubtful that any of the Knox players you watch today will play here as pros. But that's not why the young men you saw today went to Knox. They chose Knox because of what happens in the classroom. They chose Knox because of the life after football. They know that Knox is the big time. In almost every field, from academics to law to medicine to some of the country's most important corporations, even broadcasting, Knox has led to accomplishment. To help continue that success, consider joining the Siwash Athletic Club, which is connected not only to athletics, but to the overall academic mission of the college. And one final thought. Keep in touch with Knox. Return to campus when you can. I guarantee you'll like what's happening there there is an enthusiasm and excitement that is contagious. Knox was great when you and I went there, and as a frequent visitor to campus, I promise you, Knox is even greater now. Thanks for watching.